Hi guys, so today we're going to talk about the A30 Challenger tank, Mark 1, and the A30 SP tank destroyer called Avenger, and cover their background, design, and fate. The British had entered World War II with very little in the way of tank destroyers, or at least how we would think of such a term. Indeed, the notion was somewhat alien to them, as much as many other nations. Few of the combatants in the early war years had dedicated machines, with most being hastily improvised along the way. The UK, along with nations like Germany and France, used tanks to support infantry and engage other tanks as a secondary role, while the destruction of enemy tanks would be primarily down to anti-tank teams with towed guns. It quickly became apparent that this was causing problems, notably in mobility, where tanks were often able to easily outpace the slower truck and horse-drawn towed guns that took time to limber up or entrench. Only the US was marginally ahead of the curve, desiring both tanks and tank destroyers in 1939, yet this was for a different doctrinal purpose and would create its own problems later on. What was required rather urgently was a means to transport anti-tank guns to where they could be used quickly and to keep up with mobile tank formations, while crossing the same terrain and then be used to destroy tanks and add supporting fire. This led to an odd collection of hastily improvised vehicles in the early war years, often with conventional anti-tank guns merely plonked on top of whatever hulls were available at the time, ideally those no longer suitable for frontline service, with such examples as the British Deacon or German Jägerpanzer Mark I. As with all designs, these vehicles were stopgaps until all the various aspects involved in the development of a vehicle could gain insight into operational use, manufacturing capability, manpower and other technical aspects. Once this was in place, various nations began to quickly design and develop tank destroyers to operate within their military forces. The UK was also stuck in a quandary as to who should use these vehicles, the Armoured Corps, the Royal Artillery or an independent formation. The latter notion was quickly dropped and there was for a short time a tug of war between armour and artillery, but it was decided that as the Royal Artillery had the most expertise in using the weapons and tactics favoured it should go to them. Thus, the SP, or self-propelled units within the Royal Artillery, were created. By 1942, the British were looking at a wide variety of platforms, and this is where it can get a little more complicated, as both conventional field artillery and those made for destroying tanks came under the same SP heading. An example would be work on the early Valentine, where we have a both 25-pounder and a 6-pounder SP in the same period, but for different roles within the same regiment. So this leaves us multiple classes and roles. The Royal Armoured Corps also wanted vehicles armed with a 17-pounder gun in its own units, but these were not to be called tank destroyers or SP guns to prevent conflict with the Royal Artillery, who now saw this as their territory. Thus, we end up with vehicles like the A30 Challenger, Clan, Commodore and Flyerfly, the last being the oddity as most retaining names beginning with letter C and were tanks. Furthermore, the British were also working on the development of assault tanks by several companies, notably Lord Nuffield's AT series, part of the Tortoise class. However, these were to never work as part of the Royal Artillery and are not SP guns and are not tank destroyers in any way. But neither are they pure tanks, being a class of their own to support the engineering units. Then we have SP guns such as Archer, Avenger, Achilles and Electo, all with A names with the last one, Electo, being a hybrid role, having either the capability for indirect or direct fire roles. And that leads us to the conventional SP systems, those designed to lob rounds onto targets. These often had ecclesiastical names, Bishop, Priest, Sexton and Cardinal and so forth. So on to weapon choices. While the six-pounder gun was in many respects a very capable weapon, the gem in the British anti-tank line was the 17-pounder, a 76.2mm anti-tank gun with formidable stopping power, quite easily able to tackle any German tank of its time, out to a very long range. However, it was also very heavy, large and cumbersome. It was quickly desired that such a weapon be mounted on a track chassis to give it the much needed mobility and overall improve the stopping power of the Royal Artillery in non-pitched battles. Several firms competed for this contractor idea. Nuffields had drawn up plans for a 17-pounder in the Crusader, essentially a resid hull with a gun more or less plonked on top. This never progressed very far as so it was too tall, off balance and the Crusader was rapidly approaching the end of its useful shelf life. Vickers, meanwhile, ever eager to get a slice of the pie, put forward their proposal. 
This was initially to be mounted on the Vickers Vanguard hull, and a series of wooden mock-up models were made to demonstrate the idea. It proved tempting, however the Ministry of Supply wasn't too keen to start a new production line, and thus required any work done by Vickers to utilise the Valentine hull. This they did, and so the SP-1 would be designed, which would go on to become the Archer and would serve on to the end of the war. Meanwhile, an idea put forward at the tank board minutes by Rolls-Royce was for a Cromwell to be used. This would originally have been done by the Royal Ordnance Factories, a group of factories under the Ministry of Supply, who would convert battle-damaged Cromwells into 17-pounder carriers. Two firms picked up on this. One was Birmingham Carriage and Wagon Company, who produced Cromwells at the time and began on working to convert their Cromwell hulls over. To do this, they had the same problem that had been discovered by others, that fitting the 17-pounder gun into a standard turret was no easy feat. The gun was large, heavy, and had considerable recoil, and the War Office stipulated it was to have a four-man turret. To accommodate this, they used a large boxy turret to fit the system in. This in turn increased the weight by some six tons, which meant they would need to lengthen the hull, and so an extra road wheel was added. This new vehicle was named the A30 Cruiser Mark 8, Challenger Mark 1, and was a tank, not a tank destroyer. Rolls-Royce had also been working on a 17-pounder tank, known as the A29 Clan tank, after the Clan foundry in Belper. This unusual vehicle, which shared many features with Cromwell, had a large turret with a 17-pounder gun fitted. In order to take the extra weight without lengthening the hull, they decided to lower the ground pressure by giving the vehicle a twin set of tracks, an outer and inner layer. This offered them the ability to cross Bailey bridges, an essential criteria of the time, by narrowing the vehicle's overall width if needed, and avoid the hassle of lengthening the hull. Ultimately, the vehicle was never built, as this system was deemed too complex and time-consuming. During this period, pressure was taken off the various firms by the introduction of the Americans, who had supplied large numbers of M10s. These relatively fast tank destroyers, armed with a less potent but still useful 3-inch gun, were able to fill the roles required in many areas, and the fact that the vehicle could also fit the 17-pounder gun gave the UK an answer it needed, albeit temporarily in the form of the M10C Achilles the letter C being used to designate she had a different weapon from the standard. Meanwhile, the tank board, and particularly William Robotham from Rolls-Royce, who had been instrumental in the development of the Rolls-Royce meteor engine, was keen to have a meteor-powered tank with a 17-pounder gun, as, apart from a few fixtures, it would offer the required offensive capability without a great deal of disruption to the Cromwell production lines. Thus the systems rushed into production. The turret was made by Stotham and Pitt, who normally made cast iron cranes. The whole concept from start to finish took eight months, a near record in development times, and the vehicles were sent to Aldershot for trials. The vehicle performed relatively well, bar a few teething problems. It was higher than Cromwell by 10 inches, but still 6 inches lower than the Firefly, and due to better ground pressure was faster than its Shermany cousin, and offered better gun depression angles, but carried less ammunition due to the two loaders. Ongoing dithering and delays by the War Office led to the vehicle not being accepted for five months after she was ready, but she would see action in Normandy, and Challenger would serve until the end of the war, particularly with the Polish. Post-war, she was almost immediately phased out of service, as was Firefly. During her service life, only one major upgrade was proposed, and this involved armouring both her hull and turret to six inches. This new vehicle would have been called A-40 Commodore, taking the older name given to the A-33 assault tank. A second series of vehicles began around the same time as Challenger, under the designation SP-2. This vehicle was to be built by Leyland, and would initially use the Cromwell hull with a redesigned turret. Early plans included not just the 17-pounder, but the 55-pounder gun, which would end up as the 114mm, yet would never see service, at least in this role. However, the reason for the larger open-top turret was to accommodate this weapon, as well as the heavy counterweights added to the back of the turret. Unlike Challenger, this vehicle was a tank destroyer. The new vehicle, given the name A30 SP Avenger, and although frequently brought up in the Department of Tank Design Minutes, would not arrive in time to see action in World War II. At least two versions were produced, the Mark I and Mark II. The original batch, once considered just a prototype, but from archival evidence suggests at least 15 to 20 were made, were based on modified Cromwell hulls, and then after the war's end, those in production switched over to Comet hulls. Avengers turret is of a low-profile design, with a large cast turret front bolted to a welded turret rear. 
the open top could be covered and a special roof was made that could be raised or lowered with a canvas screen between the gaps. This gave the vehicle an adjustable turret height which allowed the weapon to be used inside the closed turret if needed and the canvas could be attached to allow plenty of ventilation. Avengers next crop up at trials held at Shubri S for primarily armour and evaluation trials where the results were fairly average. The vehicle was not designed to exchange blows with other tanks however the gunnery trials proved satisfactory. Avenger had an internal gun mantlet and testing proved to be able to withstand 2 pounder and 6 pounder shots to the turret front. The vehicles were then shipped off to the British Army on the Rhine, where they would mysteriously vanish after about four to five years in service. The fate of the Avengers is a mystery. Extensive research in archives, checking notes in parliamentary meetings, and even speaking with those that served in Germany during this time have revealed nothing, and even the range wardens both in the UK and Germany from the period can't ever recall them being used as hard targets. Even photos of them deployed are extremely scarce, with just three or four photos known. It is known that one or two went to Denmark and ended up on the ranges there, but that's it. Figures and numbers built vary between 70 to 100, yet today none remain, and their fate will remain a mystery for the time being. It's been said before that this vehicle wasn't very good, yet there seems to be no evidence to support this. Certainly the records held at both Bovington and National Archives lack any information to support this claim. Avengers being removed from service would have been natural with Centurion in service and the future of tank destroyers looking increasingly like it would be missile based and were likely simply obsolete as a concept, yet until actual evidence arises it can't be said for sure. Today just two A30 Challenger tanks remain. A good example in the Netherlands and a very damaged one in storage at Bovington and no Avengers survived or perhaps they simply have not been discovered yet. Well guys, if you like this quick chat, let us know below. Any other vehicles you want, give us a heads up. Uh, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe doohickory thing down there. And until next time, toodle pip.